The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is my good buddy from down under. His name is Martin North. Martin, welcome back to the show, my friend. Hi, George. Good to see you again. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing well. I think a better question is, how on earth are you doing? <laughs> how is Australia doing? I'm getting uh, all these stories that just seem like it's straight out of 1984, especially with New yeah, South Wales. And yeah, I've been well, tweeting about them and everything, but I really wanted to have you on first and foremost to give me kind of the boots on the ground as, sure. as to what's happening there. Well, I think the wheels have fallen off a bit. Um, you know, we, we had, um, during the early part of the pandemic, uh, we locked the borders quite early and we actually kept it out for quite a long time. And so there was a sense of, what well, nothing to see here, you know. We, we, okay, we can't travel internationally. Uh, we had a deep, deep recession that bounced back and everyone was saying, in fact, they were saying even at the end of 2020, 2021 will be a great year, right? Well, actually, now I think, 2022 might be a great year, but 2021 wasn't, right? Because unfortunately, the border controls, particularly at the hotel quarantine level and airport level, weren't sufficient to keep the virus out. And so we started to see spot infections appearing. And then a few months ago, the Delta variant started. Uh, it started in Sydney. Um, they didn't act quickly enough. So it got out basically, and it's now out in the community. And we're seeing a uh, thousand plus infections each day now uh, in New South Wales. It spread to the ACT, which is our you know capital city, and and down to Victoria. The other states, though, have been able to essentially keep it um, out sufficiently. So we've got this amazing sort of border. You could draw a line at the moment between <laughs> New South Wales, Victoria and ACT and the rest of the country, right? And now the rest of the country is saying, well, we don't want it over here. Whereas in New South Wales, what they're basically saying is, well, it's out. Um, we're never going to be able to control it. They've actually stopped reporting some of the key statistics in terms of how many people were in the community when they were carrying the virus. Um, they've now turned the volume towards vaccination programs we've got to get you know 80 percent of the population vaccinated and uh, if we do that then we can open up we can give people who've been vaccinated extra access to things through sort of vaccine passports but they've locked down certain local government authorities lgas they've got curfews in place they've got very severe restrictions in terms of people's movements um other parts of new south wales still locked down so we're locked down we can't go more than um, um uh, 10k or 5k from where we are at the moment and uh, have to wear masks out, outside so we've got these sort of draconian controls on one side while the virus is is bubbling away but the other point that people are missing is that they're not reporting the full story with regard to infections because there are a lot of people who are actually infected but are being managed in their homes under, quote, hospital conditions. But those numbers aren't in the hospital numbers. So, in fact, they're artificially suppressing what the real story is in terms of numbers as well. So there's a bunch of stuff going on. Say the numbers were 100 times worse yeah. than being reported. Uh, at, at what cost does the Australian public have to pay for... Well, that safety or for for health and is the is there a cost or a price that is too high to pay and that's precisely the you know the debate and the and the question right because on one hand obviously any death is unfortunate but of right. course in a normal year you know when the, when flu comes through there will be deaths right mm. um so the question which people are wrestling with is you know have we move the dial too far to try and actually alleviate deaths because nobody wants deaths, although, of course, we are getting deaths, unfortunately. Um, but the economic consequences is, is what I'm, I'm interested in. So we've got a lot of small businesses and a lot of households who are under severe pressure. Last time around, there was a very, very large support program. Right? The size of the support programs this time is about one-tenth to one-fifteenth. So Mark, when you talk outside. about support, you're talking about stimulus, government stimulus, right? I'm, I'm talking about money paid direct to businesses to pass right. on to employees to keep okay. them uh, associated with their businesses. I'm talking about direct support for small businesses. Um, also, last time around, they threw a lot of money at the banks directly. 
and also indirectly. Um, so all of those things were there. And we got this wild situation where the, the whole economy, so, you know, the last quarter, we just crept over the line in terms of GDP growth, but it was only, frankly, because all of the imports of the vaccines added to the GDP. And is, that, <laughs> is, that, is that nominal or, or real, Martin? Well, uh, that's, that's, that is real GDP. Okay. Um, but of course, it's, you know, GDP measures all, me measures all activity, good or bad, whatever the, the cause. So it doesn't necessarily tell you that much. But this right. coming quarter, we're definitely going to be underwater. Now, the Reserve Bank is saying, and this is a blip, you know, once the health thing is sorted out, we'll, we'll, we'll recover. But the consequences of what's happened here in terms of economics, but also in terms of society and in terms of mental health, I think are very significant. So, for example, obvious analysis of where the virus is at worst at the moment shows there's a very high correlation with larger households, lower socioeconomic groups, those with high levels of what I call mortgage stress, which is something we map and measure here. So we've got this, this spotlight uh, of the virus spotlighting the social issues that we've got in society, right? Whereas other parts of society, you know, the, the eastern suburbs where, you know, things are not, not as bad, people say, well, not much to see here, you know, just we can't go do the things we could do. But but in those areas, it's really brought up a lot of social issues. And then more broadly, you know, it's very hard to know what the impact of people not being able to go to school is over the medium to long term in terms of education, in terms of uh, things like, you know, the most reports. likely the, the government measures are most likely disproportionately affecting the poor. Well, that does seem to be the case. And uh, now there's a debate in New South Wales, or maybe we should open up some areas where the infection levels are much lower and, and only focus in on those areas where the infection rates are. So you're starting to create this sort of diversity between you know, the haves and the have nots, the, the infected and the not infected, the people who've been vaccinated and the people who've not been vaccinated. So you're starting to see these cracks appearing, right? And, and the thing I'm concerned about is you've got the cracks within New South Wales and then you've got the cracks across the country. So Western Australia are saying, well, we want to keep the, the virus out completely. So, you know, even if everybody else is going to open up, we probably won't. And Queensland is saying something similar. So we're starting to see. You know, as far cohesion. as you mean, you, you, you open up, you mean taking flights from yeah, other, like taking as an example, Perth and allowing doesn't want people to take from the east, from Sydney, from the east to go west and the west. Right. Yeah, exactly right. So at the moment, our air travel is way, way locked down. There's almost, mm. you know, very, very little um, 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 air, air travel. Now, of course, in Australia, it's a big country. Air travel is such a critical part of it. So right. all of these things are are in play at the moment, and um, I just wonder whether we we've, we've lost a couple of very important questions, right? The first is, well, what is society for in the first place, right? right? The second is the amount of power and the amount of, you know, orders that have been dictated from on high, particularly at the state level, but also some at the federal level, um, seems to me to be asking fundamental questions about democracy and, you know, who makes decisions on, on whose behalf. And then you've got this weird situation where you've got scientists on one hand saying one set of things and then politicians interpreting what the scientists are saying and then giving political messages. Mm. So even some of the communication from the politicians aren't necessarily accurately reflecting what the scientists are saying. So right. there's a bunch of things going on here, and, and it's pretty uncomfortable, frankly. And by the way, we also have a federal election coming up sometime within the next few months. And some would say that some of what's being done is more about politically positioning for the election that's ahead than anything else. So, for example, we suddenly found a bunch of extra vaccines from Singapore and then from the UK, which we hear in the next um, you know, few weeks. So suddenly there's a sort of a surge of, of, of new vaccines. And, and it's like, well, if you'd only done the homework earlier on and put the planning in place, we could have actually had the vaccination program running smoothly and it wouldn't have actually required this draconian approach we've now got. So, oh, it, it's a mess, frankly. And, you know, the economic, social, mental, and the um, ongoing issues. But here's the thing. Property prices, they're still booming. <laughs> they're see up that, more than 20%. Uh, yeah, see, that, that, that's, <laughs> see, that's what I wanted to, to get into a, a little bit more. I, you know, my big concern with Australia for the whole world right now is just an attack on personal freedom. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I just get, 
you know, people kind of tend to look at a snapshot in time as though the government power, the power we've given the government will stay as is, if not get better or go back to 2019. But mm -hmm. I think what they're missing is they're kind of looking at it as though it's a snapshot where yeah. I see it more as the beginning of a video. This is just the beginning of a 10 minute video. The first minute, <laughs> just wait till we get into minute eight, and nine. You know, what wow. is the what is the government or what is there? Uh, you know, is it going to be a totalitarian police state? That That's really my concern because that happens incrementally, you know, yeah. but but let's just I know it's kind of a touchy subject down there. So let's let's talk about the economics of it, because I, I just I still can't understand how on earth you can lock people in their homes and let them out an hour or two hours a day and not have GDP go down by 50%. Or, I mean, yeah. how is that possible? It, it, maybe I just didn't understand or appreciate the percentage of people that, that can work online. Maybe, maybe that's it. I don't know. What do you think? Well, there is definitely a, a significant drift online. So, you know, the more affluent people who have jobs where they can work remotely, um, and a lot of people are, uh, is definitely supporting jobs in those areas. But a lot of small businesses, uh, a lot of people who have to go to work to go to work um, are still going to work. Right? Yeah, how is the but, service sector even surviving? I just don't get uh, it. No, well, it, it's certainly difficult. So we've had issues with um, drivers, for example, you know, transport drivers, um, logistics, those sorts of things. So uh, supplies to some supermarkets are looking a bit shaky now. The Australia Post had to stop picking up parcels in New South Wales for four days to try and actually deal with the backlog because some of their uh, drivers were, uh, you know, out of action. So, you know, there, there, are, there are fallouts and consequences, but, the, you know, the GDP number, which, of course, was only back to June, so, you know, the, before this really hit, right? Oh, right. Um, it was already sort of, you know, obviously things were going to go a, a bit off the rails. But like I said, the GDP number was supported by the fact that we... You know, had a lot of medical activity, which, of course, was GDP, and that helped. And the other thing, of course, <clears throat> remember, our economy is very, very reliant on exports of resources, specifically to China. Holes and homes. Big... Holes and homes. <laughs> Hole... yeah, 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 you got there. Yeah, exactly right. So, so basically, you know, you've got an engine of the resource sector, an engine of property and construction right those are the those are the big engines of you know and frankly there isn't a lot else after that we discussed before it's a very narrowly based economy um now of course the iron ore price has come back since then right dramatically um because of china's new policies and, and those things so that could be an issue um but the consequences of last year with regard to property is interesting so the government announced a thing called home builder which essentially allowed people to get money directly to go buy a homeland package they spent three billion dollars on home builder what, so what, is a, this, what is a homeland package martin a, a home and land package is basically oh, okay you, you you know you, you find a green field site and you go you go and build got it a, a house on it right okay uh, and, and so there was this big surge of people signing up massive um throughput in terms of um you know new projects being started prices of homeland packages went up by precisely the amount of the stimulus so it was a net sum game but now of course they can't get the materials and they can't get the builders and so you've got these people who signed up some months ago and and, and it's not progressing but nevertheless you know there was a big spike in approvals for building and then it's dropped away again and there was a big um movement up there so that's one example another example is the government, um, through the Reserve Bank, handed over $190 billion to the banks at pretty much free money called the term funding facility. That, that money then allowed the banks to lend more, except they've parked twice that back at the central bank. So we've got reverse repos just like you have in, in the US, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of liquidity flowing around. But interestingly, the banks who were reported just recently they've been able to increase their profits and they actually declared in their margin an improvement of about, for example, CBA, four basis points, simply because of that very cheap money, the term funding. So in other words, money from the government through the RBA went to the banks. The banks then actually had their profits improved and now they're basically buying back their shares. So you've got this flow of funds 
<laughs> funds around, right? It's nuts. And again, the banks, of course, because of that very cheap money, are more than desperate to write bigger mortgages. So data came out recently to show that there's been a lift in high debt to income lending. Um, in other words, people are borrowing more and are more leveraged. And of course, everybody says, well, that's fine, because of course, interest rates are really, really low. So what could go wrong, except of course, the loans are what 15% bigger than the new ones than they were this time last year. So we've got this debt bomb continuing to tick, we've got the housing sector continuing to tick, and houses, you know, we'll talk about um, high rise in a second, but houses, you know, standalone houses have gone through the roof, literally, they're, they're very, very expensive now, and people are finding it harder to, to buy. That's at a point where we've got negative net migration. So there's no migration, no, no, no people coming in. So this is all homemade, as it were, people moving around, right? Um, so all of these factors are driving some really weird behavior, economically speaking. And of course, um, with all of these things, there are unintended consequences. So one of the unintended consequences is that people are finding it very difficult to be able to, um, you know, to afford to buy. The mortgage is going up, the amount of debt's going up, but the bottom line is houses continue to rise in terms of value, but high rise apartments and a new construction for high rise, different story. So prices are still sliding, a lot of spare property. Frankly, nobody wants to live in high rise, particularly when they're so poorly built. And uh, of course, a lot of that was targeted in the investment sector of the property sector and uh, property investment even now is looking pretty shaky. So I did some calculations the other day and still more than 60% of property investors, even with the increases in house prices, high rise prices are not gone the same way. The rental returns are negative. And interestingly, there's a high vacancy rates as well. In other words, people aren't being able to let their investment property. So they're trying to sell. So we're seeing this sort of really weird pivoting going on. So mm. it's a, uh, it's it's a bit chaotic and again i think we you know we, we've lost the plot really in terms of well what's the economy for what's society for you know what what is the government for you know surely it's about you know allowing entrepreneurialism to run it's trying to actually get barriers out of the way and make things happen rather one than what they seem to be doing is putting barriers in place and then artificially stimulating and supporting particular sectors of the economy Guess what? Those sectors of the economy are very strongly aligned to the current, uh, you know, parties in charge, and so there's a political overlay here too, which I think people probably miss. Yeah, I mean, you have to let people out of the house for more than an hour a day for them to start a business. You would think. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I survey small businesses, right? And and last year, through the programs that were in place, most small businesses had issues, but you know, hang on by their finger to, fingernails, right. as it were. But a lot of them use their resources. But now this time, small businesses are, are really in, in significant pain. So the tourism sector pretty much um, drying up in, in, in many places. Um, education sector in difficulty. And even some people in the construction sector, you know, they can't go to work because they've got still issues. So, for example, we've got um, infection rates on some construction sites very high. So, you know, they're having to deal, deal with that too. So, yeah, we've got a situation where there are, great swathes of the economy, particularly down the East Coast, that are really not firing at the moment. And the question that everybody is trying to get their head around is, can we bounce back again? So the Reserve Bank, in their wonderfully optimistic science sort of signs, says, well, you know, I think next quarter will be difficult, but after that, things will bounce back, and then middle of next year, we'll be, you know, looking at a 7% growth. Well, maybe, but the longer this goes on, the more concerning it it is because essentially there's a point at which small businesses just give up. And I'm at, in my survey seeing now we're close to the point where a number of small businesses are saying, nah, can't do this anymore. Um, so it is, it is getting quite tricky. You know, I was listening to uh, a podcast today and they were talking about how there's all these generational shifts or we could see some generational shifts in the United States. Mm. And they use the example of the Great Depression mm. and that the, the kids that were born or raised during the Great Depression in the United States, how, and I forgot what the, what the generation was called, the, the lost generation or something like that, um, that uh, for the rest of their lives, they never spent money, mm. never. 
They, yeah. they saved every single penny, no matter how rich they became, no matter how much the, you know, their house price went up or whatever, they just flat out would not spend money yeah. because they, they were so, um, petrified or the hardwiring, you know, in, in their mm-hmm. psyche just got, uh, to the point where they were always concerned or we better save, we better save because you never know when the next, uh, depression is going to come. And, you know, I think we have just such a huge advantage of looking at the great depression in hindsight mm-hmm. knowing that it ended in let's just call it the early 1940s but think about being someone that lived through the depression in the year let's say 1945 you didn't for all you know the he- the united states could have been heading right back into another depression how do you know mm-hmm. that you're yeah. going to go another you know, five decades or, or, or plus whatever, without seeing another great depression. So it makes a lot of sense. So what you're telling, you know, when you talk to me about how the, the, when you survey small business owners, and they're really getting frustrated, and they're just kind of waving the white towel, or the white flag, it makes me think, you know, maybe that, that you're, they're doing the same thing to where they will never start businesses again, because they don't know if the government's just going to go into a lockdown, Again, I mean, fast forward three, four years. Well, mm-hmm. you know, after they've gone through this in 2020 and 21, yeah. they're like, well, how do I know we're not going to get another variant or whatever? And the government's just going to lock down again. There's no way I'm going to start a business. So do you think there could be something like that going on there or throughout the world for that matter? Mm. Well, yeah. And look, my parents grew up in the 30s and 40s, right? And I can still remember that my mum always kept more canned food in the store cupboard just in case, right? Mm, because right. she'd been through precisely those situations where everything was on ration, everything was hard to get hold of, right? And and my parents were people who would not get into debt. I mean, they, they did take a mortgage to buy their, their property in the 50s, right? But they paid it down as quick as they could, right. and they refused to get into debt ever again right now yeah. you know one of the reasons i guess why i'm a bit concerned about people incurring so much debt is because it just seems normal for a lot of people you know i'm probably influenced by my parents who actually have the view that well actually you know debt is a necessary evil but you don't you don't wire it into your in, into your finances and just go on doing it right yeah. um but more broadly their whole philosophy and approach was on the assumption that things could go pear shaped again because they'd experienced really big pears, right? And I mean, things got really, really bad. And so it fundamentally changes your whole outlook. And you're right, it isn't just a point in time, it echoes down through the years and it evenly, even echoes into you know, the next generation. So my yeah. own psyche and approach is to an extent influenced by my parents. Mm-hmm. Right? And like, you know, I think that's the first observation. The second observation is, um, if you if you think about um, you know businesses, there are a lot of businesses who've been around for quite some time, and there are people um, in in their forties and and fifties and into their sixties, right? And 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 the question is, at what point do you just say it's too hard? I'm just going to give up. And in the statistics, in the employment statistics, I'm seeing a lot of older people just taking themselves out of the workforce and saying mm. it's too hard. I'm going to give up. Now, and I so, think so do you that, see the labor force participation going down? Yeah, it's actually dropped, a, dropped a little bit because people have stopped looking for work, particularly mm. now. Um, but it's that distribution that's quite interesting. So we've got this, this sort of generation of people who may never work again. Right. right. And um, that's something that, uh, again, my parents mentioned to me years ago was that there were the, people who basically gave up, right? It became just impossible. And and so rather than thinking about a can do, you know, we're going to get through this, it starts to turn into a negativity, right? And that's that Mm -hmm. sort of negativity sometimes that I think is probably more corrosive than anything else because it's an attitudinal thing. It's very hard to deal with. And and if, if governments don't understand some of the psychological forces that are in play and just, you know, go hell for leather down a particular route without really understanding the implications and fallout, then I think that's a big deal. The other point you made about more variants 
um, is important, right? So there's the Colombian variant, the World Health Organization mentioned it recently, the Mu variant, which is a one from Colombia, which looks to be pretty uh, worrying. And, and, you know, people are now saying, well, hang on, you know, are vaccinations going to decay? Um, is there a chance of more lockdowns? And, um, you know, in Australia, people are saying, uh, well, the policy is, the plan is we, we, we'll, we'll get to a level of vaccination and then we'll unlock and we'll never lock down again. But oh. I don't see how they can say that, right? Because history has shown us that over the last few yeah, you know, months and years, they just locked down a drop of a hat. So it just the level of uncertainty is remarkably high. Um, and then, of course, just to add to the insult, as it were, you've got the China connection. So a lot of our trade connections with China are actually fragmenting at the moment. They are. So what happened there, right. Martin? Can you explain that for uh, the American viewers who maybe haven't followed that? Well, yeah. So over the last 20 years, China has become by far our biggest trade partner. So yeah. they, they've bought a lot of raw materials from us. In return, we've tended to buy a lot of uh, goods from China. Um, so... A lot of our building supplies, for example, come direct from China. Mm. Right? Um, we sell them a lot of iron ore. It's by far the, one of the biggest one of exports that we have. It's a very large proportion of our, of, of our total exports. Um, and they use it to make steel, and then they sell the steel around the world, except China has now done two things. Firstly, they said, well, we're going to actually control the amount of construction and particularly steel making. So they making less steel. Secondly, they're looking to source steel from other places because they don't like Australia's attitude. Um, and there's a few things that we've done. So, for example, um, our prime minister was one of the early um, uh, voices saying, well, we should get and have a look at the origination of this virus in China. Oh, you know? I see. And that upset I see. them. And we've had other things too. So the, the, the level of political interaction between China and Australia is at an all-time low. Um, they sort of throw barbs at each other. So, you know, politically, it, it's gone a bit sour, but it's now turning into economics. We've also got some trade barriers on things like barley and wine and have been put in place. So suddenly those export markets are looking less favourable. And then demand for our iron ore in particular has, has come off. And uh, China's looking to other um, centers now for iron ore. And of course, China's invested big in, for example, areas of Africa that also can generate iron ore. So you can see some of those things going on. So the economic dynamo that was China and Australia has definitely flickered. And the question is, will it come back or will it, won't it come back? If it doesn't come back, then we have to find other markets. And that could be a problem, particularly with the supply chain issues that we've got and the logistics of course you know costs of um, shipping is very high at the moment but also if you look at building materials and i mentioned that building materials um we got a lot of it from china the, those supply chains are highly disrupted so construction industry here in australia can't get the parts they can't get the timber they can't get the uh, other materials they need so they can't necessarily build what they were going to build so all of these things have knock-on effects so, so that's probably why house prices are going up so much when there's when you don't have a net increase in population uh, because it's just a supply issue. So you can't build. Anymore. Well, in fact, except there's one point two million spare properties in Australia already. We've overbuilt. Yeah, see, that's what's but that's what's bizarre. It, it's, Correct. it's it's like no, everyone so, has two or three properties. Well, some do, but, some, you know, but the fact is, the fact is that the um, federal government just keeps arguing it's a supply problem. We need to build more property. We need to build more houses, right, um, or, or high-rise. Um, and, in fact, they've just initiated another inquiry of one of many on housing affordability, and they're basically saying it's all supply-side, right? And that's convenient because supply-side issues are state issues, so they can say it's not our problem, it's the state issues, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is we've got a lot of construction underway. We've got a lot of spare properties. Um, and so the real story is not supply. The real story is credit availability because the strongest right. lever right. for house price growth is how much credit you can get, right? And so the problem is nobody wants to mention that elephant in the room because, of course, credit is effectively what's supporting the banks. Credit is what's supporting the housing sector. And so what they're doing is encouraging people to borrow more. And in fact, there was um, an attempt by the federal government recently to remove what's called the responsible lending obligation. So after the global financial crisis, the regulators here put in place some specific rules to try and make sure 
that the banks didn't overlend. Actually, they, they did, as the Royal Commission three three years ago showed. How but ironic! The responsible lending <laughs> obligations made sure that the banks at least thought about the people who were borrowing. Now, the government wants to remove those and say, no, no, it's down to the individual. You know, if the individual wants to borrow a lot more, no problem at all, just carry on. Um, no obligations on behalf of the banks with regards to, to that. Now, that was blocked in the Senate, shut up a house. And, you know, I had a little bit to do with that because we, we ran a campaign saying those responsible lending obligations are really important because it's an unequal relationship between a lender and a prospective borrower, right? And most borrowers, when they go to the bank, will ask the bank, how much can I afford, right? And at the moment, there's an obligation on the banks to sort of go through that process and think about it. Whereas if you remove all responsible lending, basically it's open season. And, and then they can turn around and problem, say- Couldn't that problem be solved with just the banks keeping the loans on their books? Um, well, they, most most of the banks, I mean, there's a bit of securitization, but there's not a lot of securitization here in Australia relative to uh, other parts of the world. So, so what are the banks, banks thinking? I mean, they're just lending to anyone with a pulse or whatever, yep. even during the GFC. Uh, huh. What what are they, they have no problem keeping that debt on their books and the people are, you know, buying their third rental pro- or their third investment property? Or- um, well, the, the investment sector is, is much weaker now. So, so the momentum in 2015 and 16, particularly for investment properties, led to the regulators detuning that, right, a little bit. Um, but they haven't done that this time because they're arguing, well, now this is owner occupation purchases, so okay. not, a, not okay. a problem, right? And there's an interesting contrast between ourselves and New Zealand. So New Zealand followed a similar road and when they cut interest rates and stimulated the banks and allowed them to lend house prices there went up by i think by 21 percent and in fact some months ago in new zealand the reserve bank of new zealand was specifically given a responsibility to think about the impact of house prices when they thought about monetary policy right Mm -hmm. because effectively in australia the reserve bank and the regulators say house prices nothing to do with us um, you know, it's somebody else's problem, right? And in fact, nobody wants to take responsibility for house prices in, in, in Australia. So low interest rates, nothing to do with house prices, right? <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny too, when you, I'm sorry to cut you off, Martin, but yeah. you know when you were talking about how uh, they're saying it's a supply issue, mm. which, which, I mean, okay, yes, it is true if you had a ton more supply that that would bring down prices, but that would bring mm. down the entire house of cards. Uh, yeah. that does, it just reminds me of the GFC. It's the same thing in the United States that in 2006 or seven, sure, you could have said, oh, if we just had more supply of homes, then prices would come down. But we were already oversupplied Mm -hmm. and the prices just hadn't come down to your point because of that credit. So as soon as home prices ticked down a bit and those uh, adjustable rate mortgages adjusted a little higher because the Fed raised rates, then that just Mm -hmm. the whole thing collapses. Well, the interesting question, of course, rates are really, really low here at the moment, and uh, the quantitative easing program is continuing. Um, the Reserve Bank has tuned it down just a little, but it's still still running. Rates are really, really low. Um, and of course, everyone's saying, well, you know, how long will rates stay low? Because in New Zealand, they're talking about putting rates up in the next um, couple of months, maybe. Um, and, and some people in New Zealand are saying, well, maybe it could be two rate rises to try and control the market. They're also putting other controls in terms of uh, loan, loan to value ratios and debt to income ratios and things. In Australia, there's none of that at the moment. And um, the regulators have said, we don't think there's a major issue, despite the fact that one of our major regulators called APRA um, publicly in front of the um, uh, parliament quite recently gave evidence saying we don't think there's anything you know, to worry about in terms of uh, lending standards in Australia at the same time as they were privately writing to the banks saying, we're worried about lending standards. And now mm. under freedom of information, that letter came out in the public. So you sort of see these two faces of the regulator, what they say publicly and what they're doing behind the scenes. Right. And that's classic. So we've got a lot of regulatory forces that are very strongly aligned to the interests of, of the banks rather than actually the interests of consumers. And frankly, most of the regulators here are not interested in individual consumers and uh, what what goes on. And to give you an example of that, there is um, there's been a change which basically says that you've got the ability to go to a, an independent umpire after your loan has failed, as it were. 
but not actually deal with the structural issue as to why loans failed structurally, right? Which is what the, 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 the root cause analysis question should be. Why is it that we've got people falling off the perch in terms of their loans rather than just dealing with individual loans when they go wrong, right? And talk about, well, was there something wrong with that particular loan? So we've got a regulatory framework, which is not fit for purpose. We've got a set of regulators who are just very much on the pump, pump, pump the economy, get more people to borrow more because it's the big growth engine. Um, you know, we need, we need wealth effects because the wealth effect means that people will borrow more and spend more. We need them to spend more because that's the, you know, the bulk of the momentum in the economy, but half of the economy is actually consumer, re, uh, you know, um, spending at the moment. Of course, that's down at the moment simply because household confidence is way down, business confidence is way down and people can't get out to the shops economic impact, obviously, as a result of that. So you know, all of this jigsaw puzzle of pieces, and yet nobody wants to put the puzzle together and say, well, structurally, where are we? And how do we deal with this ahead? And yet that, that for me, is the question that we should be asking. But you know, they, they go for piecemeal solutions, supply side issues on property, or whatever it is. They don't really think about it structurally, and I think that's a problem. So... How, I mean, I'm just trying to think through how, if I was in their position, I mean, if you were dictator of Australia <laughs> yeah. for uh, two or three years, you know, what, <laughs> give it Mr. Burns, we'll give you a Smithers as well as, a, as an assistant. <laughs> but if you're the evil Mr. Burns uh, dictator, mm. or, or maybe a benevolent Mr. Burns dictator of yep. Australia, well, what on earth do you do? Okay, so the first thing is what people are missing is the growth engine in the economy is small business. Mm -hmm. And small business hasn't got a hope in hell at the moment. Right? Right. It's harder to get finance support from the banks than ever before. Um, there's very little support for innovation. So I would be changing the rules of the game in terms of lending. I would make it um, less easy to get a mortgage. Um, I'd make it much easier for credit to flow to small business. And I think there will be some support programs because we need an innovation sector in Australia. We're too narrow, right? That's the first point. The second is that there would need to be much more transparency with regard to people when they actually go get a loan as to what may happen if rates would arise because people don't think this through, right? right? So people actually don't think about what happens if I lose my job or what happens if interest rates go up. And so, People get themselves into this debt trap, which doesn't spring on day one, but it springs subsequently. Mm -hmm. right? The third one is I look at migration. So basically, our quantitative easing program over the last decade plus was bring more people in. Um, and that basically led to a significant population rise, but also significant congestion and significant issues with regard to where people are going to live and what they can afford to buy, all those things. So we haven't got the infrastructure build to match the migration. So I think we have to actually deal with migration in the short term and be a bit more smart about that, but then actually invest in the infrastructure that we really need to be able to bring our, our cities back to life and to you know for the services that, that we need as a, as a population. And I think the, the final sort of leg of the stool, as it were, is that we've got the situation where we have not woken up and you know this is going to be unpopular for a lot of people who watch your channel but we haven't woken up to the real challenges of of climate change and all of those things and, and the need to adapt to a new world and i think there is huge opportunity for countries that really start taking those leading steps rather than our we're a laggard right so we we're, we're one of the highest carbon producers per capita on the planet um, so that will be another lever that I would be thinking about because that was innovation, a new way of thinking. So, for example, there's no interest in electric cars here in Australia. There's nobody thinking about building charging uh, port infrastructure to be able to actually support electric cars. So we're just so far from where we could be. So if you put all those things together, right, you, you could end up with a very different story. But over the top of it, there needs to be a new vision thing. Right, a new a new narrative for Australia because what we've done is we've replayed the tape from the last four to five decades and just done the same again, which is okay, inflate house prices, lend more debt, 
ship out more resources overseas and yeah she's just right. doubling down double down double down well just doing the same again but of course you know just doing the same again and expecting a different result is a definition of idiocy right, right. um there needs to be a new vision which is basically all, so what is australia going to be in a decade or two right what are the fundamental things we want for our community and and and, and for the economy right there's no vision at all it, it's all very tactical political spin it's all just uh well you know we'll get through to the next election so so there needs to be a a vision thing over the top because australia is hugely well placed give you an example we have a supplies of rare earths you know rare earth metals here in in, in australia at the moment what we do is you dig them up ship them overseas somebody else makes the batteries for example all right and then we import the batteries and pay a huge amount for them right well right. why don't we build a production facility onshore in Australia to build batteries, right? We've got the end-to-end -end possibility to do but, that, right? Yeah, but I think even a, a, a more specific question would be why are entrepreneurs or capitalists not doing that right now? Yep. And then kind of reverse engineer it from there because I would guess it's because of the uncertainty. It might be because, be because of taxes. It might be because of regulations. I know if it was in the United States, that's, that's definitely... Uh, what the problem would be. You just don't know what the rules are going to be tomorrow because the government keeps moving the goalposts. So it's very hard to invest, uh, you know, uh, call it $2 billion on a, a structure that you can't move ever, you know, and, and, and when you don't know what it's going to look like, not just 20 years from now, but 20 days from now. Well, I agree. I agree. The uncertainty is, is, is strong, but I also think that uh, people are going for the easy the easy money right so it's much cheaper just to invest in a mine and then just ship the stuff overseas and have done with it right so mm -hmm. unfortunately we've got some very simplistic thinking going on at the moment and yet um there is some joined up thinking needed so all i'm saying is it's time for a bit of a more joined up conversation about the economy and where we wanted to go and what we want it to be and what we want society to be and you know none of that none of that happens here right so we've got this very very sort of tactical approach how is the censorship there i, I don't know if you've been watching what's happening in the united states but you know well you, you probably i mean you're a youtuber uh mm -hmm. you you know that you, i don't know if i mean you've kind of addressed uh, the same topics but i think maybe i have a more strong opinion on certain things <laughs> that, that, that would get me in trouble with uh, you know, YouTube or, or whoever, but you know, Cerveza sickness is a great example of that. You know, that's something that I've been saying for COVID. I think now it's, it's at the point where I can actually say COVID, but uh, when I first started coming out with videos on COVID and that was January of 2020, yeah. um I, I really couldn't say it i couldn't no. say the word COVID, or the the video would be um flagged or or whatever but you know that that's a really big issue and i, I see it you know you're talking about the the disconnect between the scientists and the politicians and and here we've got an, a huge disconnect just between the scientists themselves mm. and i'm not talking about guys you know in the basement of their parents homes you know with, with cheeto dust on their fingers i'm talking about scientists from harvard from yale uh, you know from these i these respected scientists they've, they've got different opinions but some of those opinions uh you just they, they can't say and and, and mm -hmm. if they do say them on a, a twitter or a facebook or something like that um that their their message isn't going to get out and you know i think back to the 1970s or the late uh, or early 1980s with um milton friedman's series free to choose and i don't know if you remember that martin but what he would do for the first like half hour 45 minutes it was kind of like a little documentary and then they would have like a half hour or 15 minute debate uh, in a in the library, I think it was the, at the University of Chicago, with uh, guys like Milton Friedman or Thomas Sowell, they would be on one side, but then it would have a group of people that had a completely different view. Uh, the complete, uh, you know, sometimes uh, socialists or communists or Marxists, and they would sit there and just, and it was a rigorous debate by all means, but they would sit there and debate back and forth, and it just seems like today we don't have any of that. So how can we? progress if, if we won't allow just a healthy intellectual debate well you're absolutely hitting on one of the reasons why dfa exists right because i've always i'm a philosopher by training right and i love debate 
And I love hearing different points of view because I do believe that bringing people together with different points of view and having a bit of friction sometimes, but, you know, not just, uh, you know, mutually um, agreeing on everything actually right. creates much more um, insight. And uh, so on my, on my channel, I deliberately bring people on. Yeah, you know, for example, there are people who believe that crypto is the future and I've spoken to people who don't think that crypto is a good example, right? Mm. Let's have a debate about it, right? But on so many issues... You can't have that debate, and even on you know, even on on my channel, I have to be very careful because there are there are ideas and there are alternative opinions that are out there that you can't mention because if you do, you're going to get chopped at the kneecaps. So unfortunately, so you're seeing, the bottom line is you're seeing that in Australia, just like we're yeah, seeing that in the states. Absolutely, and you know, yeah. I know that there are other opinions on on many things, including some of the medical opinions that I think deserve to get an airing, but are not being given an airing. And basically anybody who is not supporting the government line, which is vaccination is the way out of this, get vaccinated, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, right? Um, doesn't get a hearing. Now, th that doesn't help anybody because the problem we've got is that there is this simplistic view that there is a simple answer to this very complicated situation right, that we're right, in. Right, right, right. I'm a great believer in understanding the complexity and mm -hmm. understanding the, the gradations of issues. You know, well, yeah, it, you can do this, but you've also got to think about this, right? Rather than just black and white saying, you know, lock down, don't lock down. You know, unfortunately, social media doesn't, doesn't help the spin that we get from our politicians they you know give their daily press conferences that you might just will not bother to listen to because it's precisely what they said yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before so it doesn't actually bring anything to the table and unfortunately even the mainstream media tend to just um be you know parroting the same story too so there is a real question about real free speech there's a real question about diversity of ideas there's a real question about how we have more intelligent debates about things because i'm a great believer in those debates being really important because it will help to inform and educate i want people to be adults and to make good decisions right rather than just grabbing the 30 second headline from a youtube or you know from an advert on tv and just going from there right that's a very different way of thinking but that unfortunately we've got a lot of people who are actually more like kids they're more right. like sort of attention span of a kid. They just want a simple, straightforward answer, you know, not They want a bumper all... sticker. They want a bumper sticker. Yeah, they sticker. do. Uh, and that's, that's really worrying because two things. One is it allows people to get away with murder. So there's a lot of stuff that politicians do that they shouldn't do. So, for example, here in Australia, right, there have been many examples of politicians basically buy, buying votes, you know, by promising to build, I don't know, car parks, for train stations right and you know uh, things like that right those don't necessarily get um the the rigor that they they, they should it's just sort of oh well, that's what politicians do right well hang on a moment it shouldn't be how what politicians <laughs> do right you know yeah. let's, uh, so so there is there is a a really weakening of political freedom and debate and openness and transparency the social media channels are part of it but it's a it's a bigger trend, and it goes. You, guys, you said something to me very important earlier on about the ear of totalitarianism creeps up on you, right? It's incremental, step by step by step by step. But if you actually stop and turn around and look at where you come from, right? I can articulate many freedoms that we no longer have than we had, right? And it's the analogy of the, the frog in the frying pan, right? Which is that, you know, you can put the frog in the flying, frying pan with cold water. You then start heating up the water and the frog doesn't notice That's right. as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until suddenly the frog gets poached. That's what I think is going on. You know, the incremental changes, the removal of freedoms, the removal of um, um, good debate, the removal of ideas and allowing different people to express their views and opinions is all part of a bigger picture where people are being dumbed down, where effectively decisions are being posed on us by people who think they know best when they clearly don't, who fundamentally believe that freedom isn't necessarily that important, that want to actually just dictate a particular way of thinking about things from top to bottom. Um, and, and what they want is basically a passive, um, you know, unengaged community that just follows the rules and allows them to do whatever they want. That is unfortunately 
Australia in 30 seconds. And I'm yeah, worried it's the about states that. as well. It's the states as well. And what's so ironic is there's just such a huge push for quote unquote diversity, mm. but yet, but yet they don't want diversity of opinion. Yeah. They want it's, diversity of skin color. They want diversity of sex. They want diversity of this and this and this, which is all great. That's fine. But then they, they, they want nothing to do with diversity of opinion. Well, interestingly, you see, I would argue that the, that, that diversity, which I absolutely applaud, right, is sort of, you know, you can allow that because it doesn't change anything, right? It doesn't fundamentally change anything. It just says, well, you know, we, we reflect on that. You know, what I'm talking about here is a much more, you know, granular level of understanding of, of what, what could be and should be being thought about and spoken about. So to me, it's just the cream on the top it doesn't necessarily change fundamental behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. And quite often what you end up doing is you're just having the social media rant about it and, you know, not, not a lot else. I, I want to see fundamental change that actually aligns to what are in the best interests of the community into the future. Right. What sort of society do we want to be? And, you know, how do we lay those steps to take us there? That's the conversation that we should be having. But the, it goes back to there's no vision thing, right? The yeah. vision thing is what I really am very passionate about because there is a huge opportunity for people to actually, you know, reorientate themselves and think differently about where society could go and, and what it could be. And, you know, we could, we could achieve so much, you know, here and around the world if we actually did but think about it. And the other point I'd make is if you think about social democracy, you know, the thing that sort of everybody... In, in the West assumes to be the only way to do it. Only about 28% of the globe has that philosophy. Mm. <laughs> so there are actually more of the global population have a different fundamental philosophical viewpoint than what we do in the West. And in fact, I would argue that we're, we're degrading this dramatically because of our inability to be able to actually think in, 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 in visionary terms and to think about the future and to, and to lay some, some, some plans and some steps. So what's happening is that we are being squeezed and we're being degraded and, uh, you know, our ability to engage at a intellectual level is being removed. And in fact, you get to the point now where anybody who is not thinking the group think right, is right. kicked out you know, if it's not neoliberalism, um, forget it, right? I mean, those are really, really troubling signs. And um, unfortunately, um, like it or not, if you think about universities or you think about business or you think about politics, it's become a narrower and narrower and narrower field of play when mm -hmm. it should be precisely the opposite. Yeah, and I, so that's such a, a great way to sum it up. And for the viewers, I just want to encourage them to just never allow yourself to fall into that rut. Never allow yourself to, uh, you know, get into this echo chamber where all you seek out is just confirmation bias yep. because it's so easy to do as humans. Always try to seek out people who are, you know, intellectually honest and curious, not just, you know, blowhards or whatever, but people who are, are, are really intellectually honest and have done a lot of uh, rigorous research and just, you know, try, try to talk or just at least read their articles or hear what they have to say. That's one of the reasons why I interview people like Richard Wolf, who's who's a, a Marxist. You know, <laughs> he, he likes to say that he's a Marxist. I, I'd argue he's kind of more of a smaller government guy, but he, he likes uh, uh, a lot of democracy. He likes democracy, not only in politics, but in, in corporate America. That's kind of his push. But I think he likes to push people's buttons by saying he's a Marxist and whatnot. But he has some views. I mean, most of his views are, are you know, very contrary to my own. Uh, but he's a great he's a great guy. And he's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. And so, you know, I like to have people like that on. And I just encourage everyone uh, to try to seek out those types of people or that that type of content because it's just going to make your views better, uh, more intelligent, and stronger uh, moving forward. Well, you know, I've got this view that um, philosophy, which is what I did at university, is a really important um, capability because it asks you to ask questions about why are things the way they are, what's behind the scenes. You know, yeah. it takes you further, right? And actually, that's a really important skill at the moment. So just don't take the simple solution and the, you know, the 37 second video and say, well, that's the story then, right? Okay. Ask the why question. Who's telling you why they're telling you what's behind there? And what is, what is the question behind the question, right? And 
I can tell you that once you start asking the question behind the question, you'll never see things the same again, but in a positive way. But a lot of people just never get to do that. And I, I recommend that that's a really important thing to do. It, but in, with economics as well. I remember <laughs> one of the first books I read from Thomas Sowell, I, I believe he stated one of the first books I read from him was Basic Economics. And I think he was outlining that uh, specifically in the book where he says in economics, you can't just ask. In fact, he was talking about his students that he had when he was teaching and they'd come to him and he would say, OK, what happened? And I, I know we didn't have QE back then, but let's just say we had QE. He'd say, well, what would happen if we had quantitative easing? And they'd come back and say, well, the, the, the balance sheet of the central bank will expand. And he'd be like, well, that's kind of right. But he, he, he always encouraged them to say, then what? <laughs> and OK, so then there's more, uh, let's say, dollars on the balance sheet of non-bank entities in the real economy. Then what? Yep. Then what? Then what? Then what? And keep asking those questions and keep peeling back the layers of the onion. Because if you just answer that question at surface level, you're not going to understand the story at all. No, that's right. And look, the fact is that in these you know, times that we're in, a lot of people just rely on superficiality and, and the one-liners and never ask those important questions. I think it's really important. And look, it isn't just a job for academics or um, economists. It's a job for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. The more right. intelligent that we are and you know, the capacity we have and we, the more we apply it, the better we will be as a society. And um, everybody can be part of this. This isn't just something for, you know, YouTubers or, or influencers, right? This is something that everybody should engage in because I believe that the, the net sum outcome of having more intelligent debate and more thinking about some of these things can only be positive. And it mm -hmm. also helps to hold our leaders to account because at the moment, a lot of people are blindsided by what they say and just assume that that's the way it is. And actually... Reality is way more complicated than um, our leaders actually would like us to uh, think. That's right. All right, Mort, Martin, for my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? Okay, so my YouTube channel is called Walk the World, and uh, I do daily posts there on economics and finance and philosophy and those sorts of things. And uh, my website is digitalfinanceanalytics.com, where I also blog daily and uh, where I put a lot of other stuff up too. Awesome. Martin, thanks for your time. And I can't wait to do it again, my friend. Enjoyed speaking with you as always, George. Take care. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to the next Rebel Capitalist Live event. If you are a fan of the Rebel Capitalist show, I guarantee you, you will love the live event. The next one is Houston, where you can meet and listen to speakers, all your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist Show. People such as Dr. Ron Paul, Chris Cole, Lynn Alden, Luke Groman, just to name a few. If you want to check out the rest of the speaker list and find out how you can attend, we'll put a link in the description below, or you can just go to rebelcapitalistlive.com. This is an event where you can learn to build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments. But it's not just about building wealth. It's about increasing your freedom and networking with like-minded individuals, fellow rebel capitalists. It's an amazing event. I know you'll absolutely love it. Check out rebelcapitalistlive.com, and I will see you in Houston.